Thank you to our show sponsors, The Sharp Edge, Canola Master, and Adama Canada. By listening to you and remaining unapologetically crop protection, we leverage the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative solutions to your greatest challenges. Tell your Adama sales rep today what you're looking for. Fancy new opening. I don't know what to do with myself. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Smith. I am your host of The Agronomist. Uh, hats off to our producer, Jay, for doing some fancy new ad reads for us. So that's exciting. There'll be more of those throughout the show. So yes, thank you to our show sponsors. Um, and for watching tonight and for joining along with us, of course, you do qualify for those CEU credits if you so collect them. Head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists uh, tomorrow morning, and you can let us know that you took in the broadcast and get those CEU credits. Uh, today is World Soil Day. And I wish I could tell you that I knew that. And of course, I planned this whole episode because it was World Soil Day. But actually, um, this is just a happy accident. And I am so thrilled. So tonight's topic is controlled traffic farming and managing compaction. And I am super thrilled to have on with me tonight, Warren Schneckenberger out of Morrisburg, Ontario, and Scott Keller from New Norway, Alberta. Welcome here, gents. Good evening. Thanks for having us. Okay, well, um, Warren, are you joining us from your shop? I am. Uh, there's okay. a bit of a world war going on in my <laughs> office with uh, the girls being stubborn Thanks. and not wanting to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Also, now you can get a you know a quick winterizing done in between um segments of the show all right so uh yeah thanks uh kevin is here brendan i'm i'm glad we could uh entertain you while you're waiting in line at the feed mill let us know where you're from we were just talking about that i'm not sure where you farm uh so let us know okay so to start off tonight's discussion um on controlled traffic and on compaction i want to start with sort of the the why from both of you on why you've even started down this path Let's see what i did there uh so scott maybe i'll start with you you're, so let me know or, or tell our audience where you farm. So what kind of crops you're growing, what kind of soil you're dealing with. And then we'll we'll dig into the, the why in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we farm in central Alberta um, at Camrose. That's the bigger town. And we grow malt barley, uh, uh, spring wheat, winter wheat, peas, faba beans, canola, um, even did a little bit of oats. So a fairly diverse rotation um, when wheat and canola really are king in, in central Alberta here. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, real, and the, do you want me to tell you why we went to controlled traffic? Well, we'll go to that first. I do okay. want to ask what kind of soil type would be your most oh, soil type. We're, we're a black soil zone here. Yeah. So like five to 6% okay. organic matter, uh, Sandy loam. We're right. Uh, all our land is within a couple miles of the battle river Valley. So, uh, yeah. um, Sandy loam for the most part, not a whole little bit of gumbo, but really not much. Okay. Uh, Warren has got a sneak peek at some of the photos you're going to share and there are no stones. I'll let everybody know. Um, so same question to you, Warren. Uh, what kind of crops do you grow and what kind of soil are you working with? Okay, so I farm in eastern Ontario, right along the St. Lawrence River. I can see New York State from about a third of our acres while farming. Um, so we have basically the end of the glacier. Um, so we have a lot of quite variable soil, primarily clay-based and uh, varying levels of loam and the odd uh, little bit of muck and some sand. Um, most of our soil is shallow with an extremely heavy clay subsoil. So uh, deep mm -hmm. compaction really affects our drainage. Um, mm -hmm. That's, yeah, we farm a lot of clay and uh, we raise corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, some edible beans. Um, we used to have a beef feedlot, so we did have forages in the rotation, but uh, to a very small degree. Mm -hmm. Do you do you miss the forages, Warren? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah, there. From a, that's uh, a hard no. Plant. Oh no! From a health, soil health perspective, on soil World Soil Day, yes, I do. From a mm -hmm. uh, pragmatic farmer, absolutely not. 
Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Brendan tells us he is North Winnipeg in the Arbor Fisher Branch area. Beautiful up there. Um, I should have known with a last name like your risky. Um, and, uh, I, I will tell the story of the very long day I spent in Arbor once, uh, planting alfalfa seedlings, actually, if you can believe it. Anyway, couldn't walk the next day. Um, all right. So now let's move into controlled traffic farming. Scott, from your perspective, why, why this particular sort of move to managing how you drive across your field? What was the driving sort of force there? Right. So we, dad started doing zero till in the mid early nineties. And that was pretty early. Um, I, I don't know anybody in our area that was in that early. So we were already doing zero till, um, the idea came from farm tech. Um, if you're familiar with Steve LaRock, I went to college with him. He did his nuff field on, uh, I think in 07, something like that, um, mm -hmm. on controlled traffic. And he presented on it at farm tech and Steve's a smart guy and he was convinced that it's worth doing. And he, we were already toying with the idea of trying to do in a row seating. Um, we were running pretty wide openers on a flexi coil back then. Like, you know, everybody's running three and a half, four and a half, five inch paired rows. So you're pretty much moving 80% of the dirt when you're seating, even though it is just one pass. But the whole idea of, yeah, if you could get the seed in between the stubble, um, cause we're pretty flattened with our sandy soil. Like our, our land will blow if you, if you work it. And that's, that's why dad went to zero till in the, in the nineties was cause of soil erosion. Um, so it just made a ton of sense and, you know, he presented it in a manner where it's not like you're going to go out and buy all this brand new equipment just to, just to make it work. You can do it, um, modify what you have or, or make changes as you go. So yeah, I was convinced of the idea when he presented that and it, I, it was probably 2008, something like that. So, you know, okay. we, we took, we didn't really get started till 2014, but you know, I was sold on the idea in 08. Okay. I think that's still a reasonable timeline to institute something because it is still, as much as it is true, you can use existing equipment, modify it, that sort of stuff. It's still a pretty significant change in the way you're going to do things. So I think that's a pretty reasonable amount of time. I, I would consider that a fast changeover, especially in this industry. Uh, Warren, a, a bit of a different story, I'm going to guess. But what is your biggest concern? What's your driving reason for moving to controlled traffic? Yeah, Jay, you want to pull up the origin conventional tillage photo. Yes, I yeah. I label all of my photos with hilarious things. Yes. They're um, like they're like their own movies, Warren. It's great. This is the origin story, everyone. Yeah. yeah. So this is back, I believe, twenty thirteen, full conventional tillage, a lot of corn. Uh we I believe we'd abandoned plowing by then. Uh that was definitely disrupt field. And we really struggled, regardless of a dry spring, a wet spring, keeping the sprayer on top. Uh, you know, looking back, it's very obvious now why. It was the tillage. We were destroying the soil structure. Uh, trafficability was extremely poor. And we were, you know, like any more, the sprayer is our main tractor. It uh, runs four to five passes on every acre every year. And, uh, you can't have that random through the field. So very quickly, when we got a self-propelled sprayer um, back in 2009, I believe, no, I might, earlier than that even, um, we, I really focused on controlling that traffic. Um, but it was all born out of this was a common theme and we were no-tilling all our beans at that point already, um, but dealing with these ruts, even though they're not that significant, uh, it, it adds up and it compounds, especially when you're not doing the tillage. So uh, that really what drove us to uh, to make the start. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, so we're not as uh, religious about it as uh, my co-presenter, but uh, it's all based on the sprayer. And, you know, it's, it's all sort of morphed into itself as we've moved away from tillage till no till adding covers um to uh, scott's point on uh, having equipment sort of matching uh we're sort of loosely based on a 30 slash 40 foot now 
pretty close to 40 feet um, repeatability um, based around the sprayer behind me. It's 120. Mm -hmm. Scott, I think um, in in some of the discussions in the discussion document, you said that you also sort of start with the sprayer. Is that is that correct? How does yeah. that what's that thought process? for you yeah so warren nailed it he's you know the sprayer is the boss it makes the most passes over the field so you need to lay out your fields in order to make it so that the, it's convenient for the sprayer to get over things it doesn't matter if you're overlapping a bunch with a combine header or maybe even with like we do a half overlap with an air drill um a lot of times on on either side of the field but we have sectional control, so it, it we're not wasting inputs. So, um, yeah, the sprayer is the boss. And, and what Warren said, for him, just the benefit of CTF with firming up the tram lines of his sprayer and using them year over year, to me, that is something that every farmer can do. If you're not going to do make the leap of faith to do CTF on every piece of equipment, you can spray in the same spot year after year, and you're going to see a major benefit. Of, of those tram lines firming up and being able to get on the ground when it's wet, when you need to get it sprayed, especially when we got to throw the skinny tires on and go do fungicides and whatnot. And of course you're doing that because it rained. Well, that's grounds wet and you're cutting ruts and you know, now you're disking the whole field to, to fix a, a little, you know, a couple little ruts. So yeah, there's, there's a major benefit for, for farms to just think about doing CTF with their with their sprayer first. So it's a brilliant point, and I'm going to call it CTF light and or gateway CTF, um, in that it like introduces yeah. the idea and gets it there. Now, but Warren, Warren's not far from I am as the crow flies, and there's a lot of custom work done here. Uh, not that many farmers own their own sprayer. From your perspective, do you think? it would be relatively easy if a farmer wanted to do this in Ontario using custom operators with that sprayer that you could still do this. What do you think the challenge would be there? Uh, it's definitely doable. I think you'd want to pick a custom applicator that is willing to work with you because um, it will require a, an extra level of management on their point of saving AB lines. Um, yeah. But if they're well labeled and a good communication is used it absolutely could be done um mm -hmm. not every custom guy is going to be set up for that but you know especially with multi machine custom outfits which are getting quite popular two three four sprayers mm -hmm. per outfit not always with the same boom widths you know that can really uh really throw a nail yeah. to yeah yep yeah. um okay so so definitely now I would say, Scott, on your end and, and for Western Canada, I would say that most farmers I know do have a sprayer or work pretty closely with an operator that that would be pretty doable. Would you say that's that's probably yeah, it, it, everybody yeah. has their own sprayer now. Yep, there ain't yep, many custom guys left. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of the opposite to the east. Um, OK, so that i think is a, a really great place to start in thinking about okay so if we add if we just even try to stay on the same track with our sprayer that's sort of part of the battle but of course each of you has taken it a little bit further and scott i want to go to um some great evidence your first pick collage as we'll call it um okay. in spring and i think it's it's the wheat fields um but jay if you could pull up the first collage and and if you can Talk us through what we're looking at. And everyone yes. in Ontario, please look at that beautiful black soil. Um, but yes, but Scott, what are we what are we looking at? What story does this tell? Okay, so this is back in 2020 and it was it was a wet year. Um I think we ended up with 20 inches of rain that year, which is double what we get on average. Um so most of these pictures, picks one, two and three are basically taken from the same spot. Picture one here, I'm looking north. So I just filled the sprayer up. I was making the first pass, so I had like 900 gallons on them. I'm, I'm, I'm spraying with the skinny tires fungicide. And uh, we got a uh, R4038, so it's a 1,000-gallon tank with the 380 tires. And uh, 
I'm auto steering just fine. I'm looking now basically picture two that's looking south. So where I drew those blue lines, that was a river um, earlier in the year. You can kind of make out even when I, when I did the herbicide, I, I veered around it a little bit just because mm-hmm. when you're staring at two feet of water, you, you, you yeah. sit there and think, if I drive straight through this, I'm going to look really stupid if I get stuck here. So you, you just, sometimes I don't trust it. So you can see in one, I'm at, we're making no depth in the tram line. And basically down at five, that's where the tram line is um, going through the wet spot. So we're sinking, you know, I used a Sharpie as a depth gauge there. So we're sinking maybe three inches on that tram line. And these tram lines were established in 2014 and they had not been renovated at all yet. So there's easily... 15 passes over that so far. So the dummy in the sprayer, me, decides I should veer off. Well, three is right away. And and I veered off and I'm sinking. You can feel the back end of the sprayer going down. And now I'm just fighting to, to stay alive. And four, cutting even a deeper rut. And we're... The, the last picture with the Sharpie was showing that that's how deep the rut is in the picture on four. And basically is everything we I could do to make a big loop, get around, cross that water perpendicular. Cause I wasn't going to go any further South because there was even more water to, cause that's the direction the water runs. And I got back, turned around, go back going North and hit the auto steer and basically you it's it's nuts you can feel the the machine it's it, it's almost like trying to balance on a railroad top track like rails or like a, a balance beam the 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 sprayer will kind of dance around a little bit and then poof it pops right up onto the tram lines and away it goes you're not even picking up mud on the tire anymore you've got mm-hmm. two rock hard pathways right there as long as you can stay on them which We have had trouble, but here that was human error. So, you know, ideally you just drive straight through that water. Trust that that tram line is going to hold. You're going to be just fine. Go right through it. But, you know, sometimes you get scared, I guess. (laughs) Well, and and let's be honest, Scott, it's not fun to have to call for help in the middle of a wet spot when everyone's going to look at you and go, see, you could see there was yeah. water. Why did you drive through it? But yeah. it would be, I mean, it'd be lovely to be able to go back in time and see what would happen if you stuck to it. But I guess, so that was a couple of years ago. Was that very much a moment for you where now you trust that the tram line will be there and it will keep you afloat? Yes. Yeah, yeah but I, I've only, you know, it's not like I've done it 20 times, flown through a spot like that and never got stuck. Yeah. So for the most part, yeah, it it def it, yeah. it's it's worked. I haven't been stuck because I drove through. I've never been stuck on a tram line. Let's put it that way. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Now there are some uh, there are some great questions coming in and comments. Um, Jason, I'm going to wag my finger at you a little bit because we are going to talk a bit about rain. So Scott, you had you're saying that was 20 inches of rain, which was twice your average. So maybe let's put it that way because I asked Warren in the guest chat. I asked Warren, well, how much rain did he get this summer? Because we had similar, I think, and that was 26 inches. Warren, was this year wet on average for you, or how did it turn out? It was, it was weird, actually. Though bang on our uh, 30 year average um yeah it i would say it's actually the first half was a slightly above average but october was the driest october we've ever had yeah. which uh harvest awesome <laughs> yeah exactly i know we did have a wonderful it wasn't that's just that the average was there but the distribution was quite different than normal but jason was saying so this year in manitoba there was over 30 inches of rain. And Jason, I just want to point out, but what is your average? Because 20 inches, I think, anyway. Um, so this is part of, the, this is part of the, the discussion, right? Is what is your average conditions, not just in those crazy wet years or crazy dry years, but, okay. So Steve Sickle asks, um, do you have CTIS on your sprayer, Scott? 
Is that central tire inflation? Is that what that is? Yes, Probably, there. yeah. Warren, Warren yeah, does, okay. but I, I don't know. <laughs> Excellent job, Warren, showing us. Okay, so you do not, but Warren, you do. So let's just stop there for a moment. Why? Or tell us what it is first for anybody who doesn't know, because it took me a second to figure out that acronym. And we do love acronyms. Uh, but what is it? And and why did you make the decision to go with that on the sprayer? Yeah, so we've been running CTIS on the sprayer, combine, and uh, probably going to add a tractor this this winter. Um, so it's the ability. Um, the the dry power unit has a, a compressor on it that is added or in the case of the sprayer came with it. Um, and you have the ability to adjust your tire pressure from the cap. So in Scott, you, you need these um, badly. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we, we no longer make ruts with the sprayer um, because yeah. of it, um, okay. particularly with the uh, skinny tires. So those are 380 or 50 something something tires um they're vfs but instead of running them at 45 to 55 which is what you need for the road in the field even full with uh, 1400 gallons i can uh, drop down to 25 psi and when we're half full we're down to as low as 18 and i can cheat that uh, down to about 13 14 if i don't drive too fast um it's it's night and day and tire wear mm -hmm. is greatly improved. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it uh, it really should be a standard feature on a lot of farm equipment. Hey Warren, I'm, are I'm you a, running a, um are you running LSW tires with those or just um, like can you with with a central inflation? Because that's what we're, we're running on our sprayer for fats and and skinnies. And I, I agree with you on that. You can drop you run lower tire pressure with those all the time. Um, and, and that's the advantage with them, right? So, yeah, we have two sets of tires, uh, 710, 65R38s, I believe. So they're not LSWs. They're high. I, I've, the more we play with CTIS and the more research in the compaction, you know, we've done a lot here in Ontario with the soil and crop doing some pretty in depth compaction events, a lot of research. Um, it's all about tire volume. You, the, I really don't understand the LSW for a high load uh, uh, application like a sprayer or a grain cart or a combine. I think they're well suited for a four wheel drive with a static load because uh, it's going to eliminate power hop, which is the whole idea. Um, but for something like a sprayer, you just don't have the volume of air to, uh, it's backwards, to compress. I know. <laughs> Sorry. It, uh, the, yeah. uh, the, the sidewall, you don't have enough sidewall to play with. Where on my 710, mm -hmm. between 35 on the road and 9 PSI in the field, I drop the height of the machine by like 9 inches. It, uh, wow. It's quite significant. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, okay, so, so Brendan wants to know, we'll go to that, and then I want to go to Jason's question about using CTF on different types of soils, and that's Part of the reason we're having this conversation but brennan wanted to know the cost on that he's running a new holland as well with the same tire configuration so you said it came with the sprayer so then but do you know roughly what it costs if you wanted to switch something over yeah so uh, the compressor is a big part of the bill so if your machine has a compressor it'll be a lot cheaper um but i ooh, i would say retail Today would likely be fifteen thousand um, dollars. That's if you have a compressor like I did. All right. And then the compressor is however much money you want to spend, and it's all going <laughs> to depend on the application you're in and how fast you want your tires to reinflate. In the case of this sprayer, I don't really care. You know, you spend five minutes at the end of each field doing paperwork and folding booms. So if it takes five minutes, oh well. Uh, that you know, in the case of a silage trailer, you're probably gonna almost be back at the field again in five minutes. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that that is a good point. Yeah. But also, how much damage are you doing with the silage wagon, anyway? So it's it's completely 
I don't know. I guess we could have that argument that the time would be worth it, but maybe not. Maybe we just need to go with bigger tires on our silage wagons. Okay. Before we move to, uh, I want to continue on this vein of equipment side and, and uh, Scott already mentioned renovating tram line. So I want to talk about that, but I do want to just throw to our sponsors just quickly before we switch gears onto that. Our sponsors tonight are Adama Canada, The Sharp Edge, and Canola Master. We call ourselves Canola Master because we want every canola grower to achieve growing perfection. Master your canola with the 160 Acres of Gold giveaway. Enter today at canolamaster.ca. Conditions apply. So fancy. I'm just absolutely thrilled by this. Okay, great job, Jay. This is exciting. All right, okay, so so Scott, you mentioned renovating the, the tram lines. And so I guess my question would be, why would you need to? And if you need to, how often? So what does that whole process look like? Yeah, it's something that you're gonna have to do eventually cause you do, we do make ruts. Um, so we started in 2014 with the sprayer and we didn't start renovating till two years ago. And I would say that was probably two years too late so what ends up happening we run a seed master drill precision drill um independent opener um this problem probably wouldn't happen if you had a disc opener but what happens is the the straw gets pushed down into the bottom of the rut even even if there is no rut we're on on dry ground that you never make a rut on you still end up with a couple inch indent so we cheat, we don't, we harrow on an angle on our farm because just to be able to get through the straw, um, residue management has been a major problem of, of, a, of getting this to the CTF program we have now. Part of that's been crop rotation, but so you get that straw pushed down, even when you angle harrow, you are not touching that straw that's in the bottom of that rut. Well, when you're in a row seeding, that stuff is, going down that shank that shanks within a couple of inches of it the whole length of the field so you have no room for error and you end up overloading that shank if you're if you're seating it on a bit of an angle it's never an issue so there there is some issues that uh doing ctf and in a row seating have have plagued us with and that was re realizing what the problem was because you just think, well, why is it why is it always plugging in the same spot the drill? Well, it's it it's because of that, and uh, so you need to fix that. So we we uh, yeah we built a home homemade uh, renovator. Um, we got some maybe Jay, you want to flip to flip to that, and we we got these discs from Kit Kirchner Machine in in Lethbridge, and they'll sell you a whole three point hitch mounted renovator, but we didn't have a tractor with three point hitch big enough to pull it. So uh, we ended up putting on an old cultivator frame and we, ju we just had to add enough weight to it, enough ballast to, to, to get it to keep from dancing around. Um, that, that's what those cement blocks are in, in the middle. There's about 600 pounds there probably. And we ended up adding some more, we put some barrels of water on this fall. And, and when, once we got the thing set and figured out what we were doing, it, it, it's phenomenal how, how well it works. So um, we'll run over our canola stubble with it and we grow canola every fourth year and we'll run over our, uh, our pea stubble with it as well um, before we seed winter wheat. So we grow peas every eighth year. So three times at eight, we're, we're hitting, we're hitting uh, it with the tramline renovator. And that's basically to get over all the land once to fix the the years of uh of of making the ruts and ideally i would add um i'm looking at adding some rolling baskets to put on the back end because it does leave a bit of a ridge if if jay if you flip to that picture uh the canola stubble with the renovator when it's got the barrels on it so the, it leaves yeah, a real perfect. sharp edge to the to the side we end up we end up harrowing it on an angle so it kind of smooth smooths that over but uh i i'm not i'm not a fan of 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 how it how it does leave it so 
yeah or okay. putting rolling baskets on the on the back end of that would would leave a better field finish okay um so while jay is looking for that scott you also did send a video and this is so is this the renovator in action that we can see yeah yeah okay. on some piece That's okay, Jay. Um, okay, yeah. so question, that was before, <laughs> that doesn't have the water on it, right? So that you've no, figured out- No, no, I added that, added yeah. Oh, okay, it's after, okay. Yeah, yeah, I added that this fall. That's, that's okay. that video is from this fall as well, but after that I went I went and added the, the barrels just to make it cut better and, and stay, just stay in spot, because it, it really wants to dance around and mm -hmm. you, you can't have that because then it's then it's slipping into the ruts and it's not actually filling them so um yeah and speed like we're doing eight mile an hour there um okay. pulling it with a 95 horse tractor so you can do you can do 150 acres of sprayer tracks in like an hour and a half like yeah. you could do your whole farm in in a day and a half and how long does it take you to vertical till or high speed disc Cause that's, that's usually what guys do is they go high speed disc the whole field. So why don't we start putting the sprayers all in the same spot? So the ruts are all in the same spot, every pass. And, and then we don't have to work the entire field. So, yeah. So save a Kevin lot of fuel. Brings up, yeah, Kevin brings up a good point and I'm sure we'll talk about this. Cause I think Warren, we were talking about this in the WhatsApp group earlier is the, and, and so Kevin Canadian Cowland says, I just want the silage trucks and manure tankers to stop driving at an angle across the field so at least the tracks are in the same direction the field is worked and yes anyway manure tankers are a whole other story um okay i want to we will talk more about that in a minute but i want to go back to so jason votes one question so because scott you of course are on some sandy loam it's a very different soil warren you've got a whole bunch of rocks but you've got some clay some muck is managing ctf like do you manage it differently based on soil type or is it, or what might the differences be between soil type? That's a great question. Um, we don't necessarily manage each soil type individually. We'll manage each crop enterprise differently, but it will be the same. But that being said, we probably abuse our sand and loams far more than our clays because we're terrified of our clays being compacted. And, you know, everyone knows you can't hurt sand. So, so yeah, I would say we do manage it differently. And that's we're much more aggressive on the lighter textured soils. Uh, and clay, outrageously cautious. Scott, do you have any heavy clay on your farm? Uh, a, a small amount. Um, the one, one thing I'd add is, like, there was a group of us CTF cooperators, uh, and and they were on all kinds of different soils like uh steve larock for instance that he's on heavy sticky clays high magnesium uh clays so there the ctf can be done on any soil type it's just figuring out how to uh make it work and and uh the one thing with sand warren is uh when sand gets compacted it stays that way it doesn't really it, it won't alleviate its own compaction. Like a clay will swell and crack itself a little bit, but sand once it's, so we've even had to do a little bit of deep ripping um, with the thought process that we got to rip it up or get rid of that compaction layer that we had on some of our sands at the nine, 10 inch mark um, before we adopted CTF. So we kind of did that in 14, 15, on on a few acres uh that were a problem and now we're hoping that with ctf it'll be a long time before that sand is is uh is compacted again mm -hmm. for sure margaret points out that cts works on manure tankers too yes it does margaret um and i would love to see it 
uh, adopted far more than it is. Um, so yes, thank you. And and for those who aren't following along in the comments, there's been some great discussion about funding for some of these technologies. And so um, definitely one of the things to keep your eyes peeled for different funding um, opportunities. I know in the past there have been some, both here in Ontario and in Western Canada, depending on what it is. Um, and so yes, if, uh, if you're interested in some funding opportunities, keep in the loop because uh, some of these things can be at different times, uh, at least partially funded. So um, some things. All right. Okay. We've. I want to talk a bit more about equipment. And Warren, let's talk equipment mods. That's story two, Warren's equipment mods, the final <laughs> frontier or something. I don't know. Um, but yeah. So do you have a renovator? I guess that's one of my questions. Or are you going to borrow Scott's? I wish he was closer. That looks pretty mm -hmm. fun to drive. Um, mm -hmm. So in the beginning, um, we made mistakes when we were initially setting up our trams. Um, it's interesting, like so many parallels to the challenges just from listening to you, Scott. Um, like our inter-row uh, struggles are there also. They're just on 30 inter-rows when we go to corn on corn. Um, so it's really fascinating to hear that. But at the beginning, we screwed up a lot of our AB lines. We weren't very good at uh, naming them and keeping that name consistent machine to machine. Um, we're much better now. So if I make, if I screw up, I, I need to bring out what I like to call the magic eraser, which is a disc. Um, it makes all your sins go away or at least hides them. Um, we do also... Them. Yes. We we also have we still have all our full line of conventional tillage tools. So if I need to do some inline ripping or something to reset a field, I'll absolutely do that. Usually on a wheat year, so we can do it when we're dry. Um, but honestly, since we've now that we're probably nine years into tram lines, um, a lot of the issues just have gone away. Um, so. This is an example of an inner row struggle. Um, so we, this field would have been probably five years, uh, the sprayer tram being the same. And it's not just the sprayer. We have a 24 row planter pulling an air cart. We have the strip tiller pulling an air cart. So every 120 feet by design, we get the perfect storm of compaction where you have as many as five sprayer passes to possibly two strip till passes and the planter pass and then beans and wheat which is enough traffic also so when we go to strip till corn on corn you're now trying to plant right down the middle of that and so this is an example of how we're well <laughs> accustomed to farming like this just slightly off center is the uh, tram line um, you can see it the sprayer trams are really obvious as the corn stalks are well packed but that that's likely had I wouldn't even care to guess how many passes that field has had. That was first time doing corn on corn in that one. Um, we don't get the rutting anymore. And I, I attribute most of that to central air inflation on the sprayer and uh, going to IF and now BF tires. Um, we, we just, it floats and patience. Patience is the number one input that most farmers uh, have at their disposal and it, it needs to be implemented. Um, so, but when we'd go into corn on corn, this is what I kind of like to see. Um, so we have modified our strip tiller for corn on corn. Uh, we have a soil warrior unit, so they're just coulters. We're not running a shank because we have stones and these shanks bring stones up. Um, but they, there's two different configurations of those units. And so we'll modify on, so our tractor and strip tiller sprayer is all on 10 foot centers. Um, and uh, I think I have a picture of, about that too. Um, yeah, 120 inch spacing. And so it's on uh, 10 foot centers. And uh, the nice thing about this is your compaction is very predictable. You can predict where it's going to be year after year after year. And so, on those 10 foot centers, the rows on either side of those wheel tracks, we run the much more aggressive version of the strip tail unit that is able to chew through an old tram line quite effectively and make 
a decent seed bed. And because it's predictable, it's controlled, I know where it is, we've basically eliminated the uh, the yield drag we were getting in those tram rows in corn on corn. And uh, it, it, yeah, with very minimal expense, you know, only one quarter of the machine needed to be modified um, mm -hmm. to address the problem. And uh, it's really helped uh, flush out the rotation that's well suited to the markets we have here in the East. Absolutely. Okay. So we love acronyms in agriculture. So Scott, I was looking through the slides that you sent and there's one that you call nose. So what does yep. nose mean when it comes to CTF? I love this. Super good. Yeah. And yeah. So yes. nose it. No. Sorry. What'd you say? Well, I'm just, uh, Jay, I'm not sure if Jay can grab the slide that has it on there. Um, I think it's part of the, the like PowerPoint slides, if you can. Yeah. Um, oh, mm -hmm. this says that was it. Disappeared. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, this one. Okay. So nose. What does nose mean? Yep. How does it help you make this all work? North odd, south even, because then this would have helped, probably helped Warren out. So we, you know, it is important to save your AB lines. So, you know, we have all our fields entered and each field has a individual a b line and we use a plus lines um so for us north south makes sense because when we have cereals lodged they'll lay over to the east to the southeast so you can combine fairly easily going north and south where you might be able east and west one direction is going to be hell so north south was what made sense we have one field that's east and west just uh just because of some obstacles in the middle. Um, so yeah, so, cause you need to, to, to in a row seed, you need to actually seed that pass in the same direction every year. Like you skip over your, for me, I'll skip over six inches cause I'm on 12 inch row spacing. But so that zero line is a southbound cause it's even. So the next pass beside it is one obviously and it's, it's going north. Um, and then there'll be headlands on the, on the, to the left of that, or the west of that zero line counting up one, two, three, four, and counts to the right, uh, all the way to, well, it depends on how many, how wide your implement is. It might be at 70 if you're in the combine. Um, so works awesome for doing plots because you know, yeah. yeah, that variety's on 30. The next one's on 32. Same with the combine when you get there. You know exactly which which ones they are, um, but yeah. So you need to be able to seed south in that same pass every time for in a row seeding to work better. It'll work okay, but the drill skews. It doesn't matter what you do; the drill will skew a little bit. It'll pull on a bit of a dogleg angle. So if you're going the same direction um, year after year in the same spot on the same pass, you'll you'll have a better luck getting through the straw. And, and we've taken it even one step farther where we added a pro tracker hydraulic swinging hitch to our 9630T tractor. And then I added um, active implement guidance through John Deere. I put a, another RTK receiver on the Seedmaster drill. And then that keeps them both. It, it keeps the, the draft um to a minimum and and we're fairly flat like we 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 might have 10 feet of elevation change on on, on any given field um on the farm so there isn't a lot of side hills but 70 foot drills they got they they don't pull straight and don't pull even they so to because they make a hell of a mess when you don't get between the between the rows, which I have a couple pictures of some canola emergence where we were crashing and the stand is shit and where we're going in a row and the stand is awesome. Yeah, exactly. Um, and now, yeah, I think Jay's going to bring those up. There's a note on there. It says, go measure what your header width is. What's that about? Why do I, why, yeah. why do we need to measure our headers? Well, because sometimes we brag about our header sizes when we're manufacturers, you know. Um, I'm not going to pick on any certain names, <laughs> but uh, we, we used to run John Deere Draper headers, and they a 35-foot header is 35 feet uh, divider tip to divider tip, um, or it was on the model that we had. 
Um, you can't be that precise. So we're running uh, uh, a flex header. So that's a 635 flex. It is, if memory serves, it's 34 feet, 10 inches, knife to knife. So you get the divider tips and we bend them out a little bit. You're gathering an extra three to four inches on either side because you can't be missing uh, little strips of crop when you're going across the field. So um, you got to start with that because there's some that are said they're a 35 foot header, but they're only 34, eight divider mm. divider. So that's going to give you trouble um, trying to figure out how your CTF is going to work. Well, you got to plan for it is what you have to do. Yeah. Warren, you're laughing because it's true. So had, did you run into the same all the issue? Same <laughs> all the same problems. Yes. I have a max flex 1200 which stands for 12 meters, not 40 oh. feet, it's 39 right. feet, eight inches. It mm -hmm. uh, drove me nuts the first year we had it because <laughs> I was always missing beans. And uh, yeah, no, 100% measure your header. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, the Scott, the pictures you were, you were referring to about the canola, not doing well. Was that in the yep. second collage or no? Oh. I don't remember. It's a mess of straw ground. Jason had skipped through straw. it. Yeah, no, we saw yeah, it. Okay, there's... yeah, it was the one there's like a mat of straw and there's like one little yeah. lonely canola. Pick, uh, yeah, so yeah. Jay, he'll find it. We'll get to it. Brendan, while he's looking for that, Brendan says 43 foot drill, 40 foot header, 135 foot sprayer. How do I make that work? So this is actually, this is one of the places I want to get to. When you sit, let's say you're a farmer like Brendan, who's like, okay, this is interesting. I want, yeah, okay, I can, I understand sort of the sprayer thing kind of, sort of. But when you sat down with the equipment you had, was it complicated to figure out how you were going to do it? Or did you have to swap out a couple things? Yeah, here's the beautiful matted mess of canola. Mm -hmm. That looks great, Scott. No. Yeah, so that's that's <laughs> what happens when the... I, I maybe I forgot to turn the pro tracker on, like engage the hydraulics on that circuit on on that that pass. But yeah, it's 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 ugly and it's it's awful. So there there is yeah. canola there, but it's not even. So yeah, I tell Brendan like the first thing I would want to know with the forty foot header is can you spread the straw effectively that wide? And yeah. when you're unloading with your grain cart, do you have an is your unloading auger going to be able to unload so you can? keep your grain cart on 40 foot tram lines. Yeah. So, you know, there's lots of guys doing 35 foot headers. Um, once you go beyond that, it, it gets a lot more difficult without some pretty significant modifications um, to, to account for that. So mm -hmm. that, you might have to start there. And it's cause if you did go to a 35 foot header, it's pretty, I bet it's pretty straightforward to stretch that 135 out to a 140. We took our 100 foot John Deere sprayer and made it a 105 to with some homemade um, boom extensions. Um, so, and yeah, well, the drill doesn't work out, but down the road in a three, five years when you have to trade drills, then, mm -hmm. then maybe address it then to, on, on something that'll work. Right. So it doesn't, so Warren, I guess that's, that's a good place to sort of start maybe is on, uh, for your farm, how, how this sort of evolved into it. Ha you've done it long enough now. Have you made any significant swap outs, like for equipment, brought in new equipment that you pick that width or that size because of CTF? Yeah. Your favorite photo. I like big boots and I cannot lie. I, I I love it. The the big um, tires. I love it. So I, Look at that I'm gonna fatty. Answer, I'm going to answer Brendan's question first because okay. you know you, you got to look at that listing and the drill we can fix with big tires. The combine we can fix with big tires, tracks, something. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the sprayer, particularly in crop. That's going to be, and it's on most farms. It's when we go to the pizza cutters. That's where the everything runs off the rails so in his case i would focus on that sprayer and as and make a plan if you are really dedicated to the c ctf uh practice 
make a 10 year plan. Okay. The drill is going to be wore out that then we'll replace it, you know, with something that's going to match the sprayer. Um, and then the combines combines, I used to think was the deal, but you can just keep adding bigger and bigger tires to things and maybe don't have a 2,500 bushel grain cart, have a thousand bushel grain cart and maybe have two of them. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cheaper things we can do. Like for me, and <laughs> I was, as I mentioned, I have a 39 foot, eight inch bean head, not a 40 foot. Um, so by necessity, I had to eliminate the soil compaction in harvest. And we've done that, you know, tracks on the buggy tractor, these monster tires truly are magic. Um, they will go so many places the tracks will not. Um, it used to be that you'd be on the radio, hey, grain cart guy, don't go in there. Um, I'll carry the weight with the combine on tracks. And now it's, hey, grain cart driver, get in here. I got to get weight off the combine. Um, mm-hmm. It's, it's that, yeah, they're really expensive tires, really, really expensive tires. Um, but, uh, you know, if, particularly in Western Canada, you have such an advantage of those tires will fit on an air cart very easily. You get two year, two season use out of an investment um that then doesn't necessarily mean your seeding and harvest equipment have to be systematic on those trams we can just focus on the sprayer and manage grain cart traffic enough that uh, you're going to see a positive until you get down the road far enough to uh, make some serious investment in matching equipment okay i want to pause there for a moment um because i want to follow up a little bit more on this and also yes this is just a beautiful tire to look at but uh one last thank you to our sponsors tonight before we head to uh, our final segment here our sponsor tonight are adama canada canola master and the sharp edge real ag looks to farmers agronomists and researchers to give them the sharp edge on everything from agronomic problem solving to increasing profitability and improving sustainability Find out more at realagriculture.com slash the sharp edge made possible by Mazex Seeds. Such great music, Jay. I love it. Okay. All right, Warren, I'm going to ask because it should be known that I hate tires in general, mostly because of how much they cost. So if you would share with us how much a tire like that costs, I will just have a moment for your bank account. How much do they cost? Well, I was very fortunate to leverage cap funding. So the oh, fine tech nice. Canada helped significantly. Um, You're welcome. That's all plug for the soil and crop here in Ontario. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, they were $21,000 when we bought them. Today, they're $27,000. Okay. Yay, COVID. Yay. Yay, supply chains. Okay. So yes now but you all so scott brought up a really good point which brendan tagged into here thinking about the grain cart because i think this is so we've talked a little bit about manure tankers silage wagons grain carts how important is it scott that the that your carts are running that you're putting the thought all the way through the harvest process not just the spraying and and the seeding but all the way through to the harvest process yeah, the the grain cart is a that's a that's a guilty uh, piece of equipment for compaction for sure because the axle loads are are pretty darn high. So it's pretty pretty simple um, to get them on. Like with our spacing, we're on anywhere from 132 to 135 inch, and that seems to work out so well with the combines. Just two inch spacer kit to get the tires on center. The grain cart was just a fluke. The air cart on the drill on the 1910, they're, they're just all right right there on the same tram line or the, the same uh, axle spacing. And, uh, yeah, like we're running 900s on, on that grain cart. Like it would come with 30.5s. Those things never make a mark. 
Like I know it's just an 875 cart, so it's, it's a pretty small cart, but you can drive right through standing water if you want to, and they don't they don't make a mark in the in the ground. So the fact that or yeah, like Warren had said before, it's it's that sprayer with the skinny tires. So you know mm-hmm. you won't even need to do CTF once we're drone spraying. So because people have eliminated the worst <laughs> the worst rutting thing on the on the farm, but. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's important to get everything as much as you can. Like sometimes that's not going to be like, we're, we're not purists as Robert Rootwold would say from Australia, you know, we're not purists. We don't run the entire length of the field, um, with the grain cart empty just to stay on the tram lines where we'll turn and go, but we added a, sh- <laughs> um, extender auger extension for on the combine and the, the, when the track tractors, on the tram lines, the auger's hitting dead center. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of small things you can do to to make it work out. I think, Scott, on one of your slides, you had something along the lines of perfect being the enemy of of good, right, or progress in this yep. case. So you don't have to worry about perfection. It's about progress. So um, further to the point, you know, how we started this whole conversation was if you do nothing else but get the sprayer on, a set track, you're already leaps and bounds ahead of where you would be. Um, and yes, and Ray points out, yes, patience. The one thing that uh, we all potentially could have and use that costs nothing, um, but isn't necessarily the easiest thing to manage either. Now, that is one of the things that we probably should take a whole other hour on the economics of this, but I'll, I'll leave it at this. Um, obviously, there's some investment like any change would require but i think you know both of you have explained some of these things are not necessarily huge equipment change outs until you're ready to do so but they might be small changes or the most expensive tires in the world um but but scott i'll start with you from the economic standpoint um how worth it is this for you yeah we're we're not going back that's for sure um when you change your whole farm system, it's impossible to get a, a handle on what the economics are. So it's the Australians have a lot better data on on the yield increases and the potential ROI. But at the end of the day, the the, the amount of money that you invest, it's 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 pocket change. Like in the grand scheme of farming, like it's it's there's there's small change, especially with your like for instance, when I got that seventy foot drill, I want I was seeding with a sixty foot before. I didn't need 70, 70 made CTF work costs $20,000 more from a 60 to a 70. And the, you still would have had the same size air carts and, and whatnot. So that's, that's a, mm-hmm. that's a small investment, especially when you do over time. The biggest investment probably is GPS equipment, like, especially for, for the John Deere stuff, like you're out of the box, brand new, you're, you're talking almost 30 grand per, per machine. And like we bought, back when you know there was a lot of the upgrades that they don't they don't have anymore so you know we might have a hundred grand tied up in in rtk we have our own base station now like that's that's by far the the Mm -hmm. the biggest investment but even that has that has a payoff like you go from one 12 inches of accuracy to to one inch you can figure that out on your sprayer pretty quick even though you're only spraying 20 to 30 dollars an acre every pass how quick saving 12 inches is going to pay for itself. Yep. Yep. And realistically, that level of investment in RTK, there are farms that do it without doing controlled traffic farming because it pays for itself regardless. So uh, it's not necessarily only an expense you would incur for for controlled traffic, if I can speak. Okay, Warren, um, I guess you get the last word mostly. But economically speaking, how does this all work for your farm? Jay, pull up. CTF in one photo. It, uh, once it comes up, <laughs> it takes um, a little bit. It's a little tired. That's it all. It does. There we so, go. yeah, this is this is CTF. It, it's look at, so this is strip tail. So, obviously, I have a major advantage because my strip tiller only has two wheel tracks every 40 feet instead of a 40 foot cultivator, which would probably have 12 wheel tracks. Um, but 
the, it lends itself so well to the way we farm with the strip till because just the by nature of strip till the whole idea is you don't drive where you plant and that's the whole idea of ctf so they they lend each other so well um but that that's it it doesn't cost much more to drive straight it doesn't cost a whole lot more to move wheels out of the way that they're not driving in your seed bed and when it works how can this not yield less or how can it yield less than mm -hmm. driving randomly where there is wheel traffic like i i've got lots of data from when we started strip till and got more into being strict about it you know that ear counts went up astronomically like 2500 plants per acre and uh naked plants uh which the way the western canada has a corn plant without an ear um, uh, that dropped off almost to its non-existent unless that plant unfortunately ends up on top of a stone um but uh you know th this is ctf it's yes it takes some it takes a level of management but the rewards are huge particularly in row crops and i could mm -hmm. see out west with moisture conservation with inner row uh planting keeping that stubble intact um for catching mm -hmm. snow and all that um yeah it, i could see in pretty well every scenario there's not too many downsides a lot of lindsay to your point you know we had rtk before we started doing ctf we started doing ctf because i had that tool and mm -hmm. uh here we are now ooh, 15 years later and uh, really reaping the benefits awesome all right well said um okay this has been again we could probably go many many hours more but this is a one hour show and i shall not uh, monopolize any more of your evening thank you to of course our show sponsors to adama canada to canola masters um and to the sharp edge which uh the latest sharp edge video for anyone who's watching um is on strip tilling in corn and it's super interesting um and of course we have one comment didn't see any hills in the in the photos what did it cost to level them well done yes okay um yes it can be done but hills is a whole other story uh, but thank you scott uh so much for joining me on the show tonight and warren thank you for fitting me into your schedule i really do appreciate it you're welcome all right okay and of course to everyone uh, if you're collecting those ceu credits head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists uh tomorrow morning and let us know that you watch the broadcast and uh, next week i'll be back 8 p.m eastern going to talk about uh ip soybeans and edible beans um, i think i'm supposed to call them dry beans anyway i can't keep up all right thank you to scott to warren and everybody for joining us in the comments and thanks to producer jay everybody have a great night cheers